Well, we're still at the Shoreline Historical Museum, and we're going to do some more proofs in predicate logic. How's that? Sounds good. Man. Okay. How about this proof? For any x, if it's a, then it's b. Uh, something is a, and let's just conclude that something is B. How's that? Okay. Keep it simple. This will be one and two. Mm hmm. I forgot to put the number of my premises. Okay. All right. So. This PI is a little fussier than UI. I can, when I do UI, I can replace those X's with any constant. Right. There's restrictions on EI. Yes. So why don't you help me out and do an EI first? Okay. Well, when I do an EI, an existential instantiation, I'm, now existential instantiation can only be applied to a line that's an existential quantification, meaning a line that starts with the existential quantifier. The existential quantifier has no tilde over it, and its scope is the entire line. It's the only time I can apply existential instantiation. And what I do is I bring the formula down, I strip away the quantifier, and I use what we call a John Doe constant, which will be a V. A John Doe constant functions in our system like the word John Doe, the name John Doe functions in law enforcement. If the police have a suspect and they don't know his name, but they want to talk about him, but they don't know his name, they will sometimes call him John Doe. And the name John Doe just is a name temporarily we use because we don't have the person's real name. So they might say John Doe is six feet two and he has red hair and blah, 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 and he's wanted for bank robbery. Uh, so V is called the John Doe constant. It just means that there's an individual and we don't have his name, but we know something is A, so we're going to let V be the A. V is standing in for whatever the thing is that's A in this case. That's got to be not seen anywhere up above, too. Right? That's right. V has to be new to the proof. And if I do another existential instantiation, I'll have to use a new John Doe constant that would be a V prime. Because if there's another existential quantification, if there were, I would have no re right to think that the other, the individual named by the other existential quantifier is the same individual named by this one. Think about that. The, your reading materials explain it in more detail. But something has the predicate A. We're going to let V be that individual that has the predicate A. And we're not assuming anything we don't have any right to assume so far. This would be EI from line two, then. All right. Mm -hmm. Once I have that now, I'm looking at back at my UI I'm going to do on line one. I can replace that X with any constant I want. Mm -hmm. I think I'll do a UI on line one, replacing the X's with these. The John Doe constant. they matched up. OK, so we'll, we strip away the quantifier. We bring it down and replace the X with the John Doe constant V. And that's UI applied to one. Mm -hmm. And that gives us our good friend modus ponens once again. Okay. That'll give me BV. All right, so we have P, P horseshoe Q, and John, uh, Mark wants to bring down Q. P, P horseshoe Q, Mark infers Q. MP, mm -hmm. three, four. Three and four, okay. okay. This would be something like Valerie is beneficent. Mm, that's Valerie's nice. Valerie's beneficent. I don't even know if beneficent's a word. It is. I should be able to say that something's beneficent. Sure. I'll do an EG on that. I can do EG on any Good. constant. Good. Good. So EG says that from a singular, we can go to the existential of it. We just rewrite the sentence, but we replace the constant with a variable of our choosing. We quantify the variable, bind it with the quantifier, the existential quantifier. We're always allowed to do that for any singular, aren't we? From the singular that V has B, we can infer that something has B every time. There's no restrictions. So that's called EG, EG from five. on line 5. And of course, your reading material and text and so forth goes into the rationale for each of these rules in more detail and depth. We don't have the time to go into all of that in detail. This is just designed to get you into the system, isn't it? Let's do an, one final proof. Okay. How about this? For any x, if it's a, then it's b. For any x, if it's b, then it's c. 
And we're going to conclude for any x, if it's a, then it's c. Okay. How's that? One would think that would be doable. So it looks a little bit like what at first on the surface? It looks a little bit like hypothetical syllogism, mm -hmm. but I can't do hypothetical syllogism because these are not conditionals. These are universal right. statements. Right. So I need to get rid of those quantifiers. It's a, yes. The uh, hypothetical syllogism does not apply to these lines as they are written. They're universal quantifications. So like Mark said, we want to get rid of the quantifiers first. All right, so what do you want to do? Uh, the order doesn't matter because it's UI on both. I'll start okay. with line one. I'll do a UI, replacing right. these X's with, well, I could do anything I want, but Any I'm looking ahead at the conclusion. Mm -hmm. And given I'm going to be doing a UG at the tail end, what mm -hmm. would you suggest I change the X's to? Well, you could use, um, how about U? Okay. The, the John Doe constant U. Okay. Okay. So A U then B U by universal instantiation on right. one. Let's do the same thing on line two. All right, we can I'll use any constant we wish. I pick U's so okay. I can get lines three and four to work together. Okay, B U or C U, universal instantiation on two. Sorry for the messy number. Now that we've got these quantifiers off, uh, we can now see we do have a hypothetical syllogism because mm -hmm. these match up kitty corners. So let's do hypothetical syllogism. That would give me A U or C U. Okay, Hi well, now we're back to our truth functional rules. Mm -hmm. Hypothetical syllogism three and four. Let's take a look. So from P horseshoe Q and Q horseshoe R, Mark inferred P horseshoe R. Okay. And I want to get a universal statement. I can do UGs, mm -hmm. UG on U. Mm -hmm. That's what I want to Since do. Since we are using a John Doe constant U, and it doesn't appear anywhere else in the proof, we are allowed to do a universal generalization off of it. So we'll use the universal quantifier, and then we'll repeat the line, but we'll replace the U with an X. See, we just took this line and rewrote it, but we replaced the U, constant U with X, and we bound it all with a universal quantifier. And that's the UG rule applied to line 5. And that's the conclusion. Once again, we're done. And that proves the proof. There is one last thing we can do. Okay. We can do a real quick demo of quantifier exchange. Okay. So let's say that I have, uh, for any X, if it's A, then uh, some x is b, okay? Line one. Mm -hmm. And then let's say that I have, it's not the case that something is not a, okay? Okay. So let's just use that to do a simple proof that something is b. That's one and two then? Okay. okay. So, as this is written, there's really nothing we can do, is there? Nothing that makes sense. I mean, I can do things like transposition or... Oh, yeah. Placement. Why? Yeah. I'd have to just yeah. be throwing things mm -hmm. around. I can't take those quantifiers off. Right. The universal quantifier is not ranging over the entire statement. Right. That central quantifier. I cannot take that quantifier off because that is not the main connective. It's not starts ranging over the entire thing. Right. That's the main connective. Right. It starts with the tilde. So really, the quantifier rules don't apply to these. The, uh, mean good. the instantiation yeah. rules don't apply. What I could do is do quantifier exchange mm -hmm. on this or this, but let's just do it on this. Mm -hmm. And what quantifier exchange will give me would be universal x, ax, and that would be qe2. Q Okay, good. Okay. So quantifier exchange just says you can take one quantifier and replace it with the other. If you take the negation, if you add a tilde to each side and then remove any double negatives that result and carry down the rest unchanged. So we turn this existential to the universal. We add a tilde to each side and cancel out double negatives and we carry this down. And that's the QE rule. In other words, we turn this into this. And the reason we would do that is because in this case, this thing is the same as that thing. We can do a modus ponens on line one. Do you have another Maybe. color? Yeah. The black one? Thank you. Oh, you're saying this matches this. 
and we have a conditional on line one. Mm -hmm. If P, then Q. Mm -hmm. P's true, therefore I should be able to say Q. So I can write EX, VX, and that'll be the conclusion we're looking for, and we're done. Something is B. By? It'll be, uh, the modus ponens. Your workhorse one, rule. Let's take a look. We see if Mark was right. P, P, horseshoe Q, we bring down the Q. So by modus ponens, we reach this, and that's the conclusion, and so we've completed the proof. I think that does it. So I hope this helps you get into the proof system, and, and of course, the best way to learn proofs is by practice. It's like uh, playing the piano. The more you practice, the better you get. The more you practice, the faster you get. Uh, you want to practice this stuff in public. Go to a restaurant or something, do the proofs, lay them out on the table. Uh -huh. The glory of this is you don't even have to get them right. You do them on the table, walk off and get a cup of coffee or a donut. People will walk by, see the stuff on your table, and go, my God, what is that? And then with practice in front of the bathroom mirror, it all has to do with the flick of the wrist. You can say, oh, that's just predicate logic. And people will think you're a rocket scientist. Oh, so, I've never done that. I, uh, I had a student to do that once. She actually was trying to get at this guy in Denny's. Uh -huh. She showed up. She laid out her predicate logic on the table. I am not making this up. She was trying to impress the guy. He walks by and goes, oh, it's predicate logic, which threw her. <laughs> and she goes, yeah. And he said, oh, I took stories logic class, which tells me that if you learn logic, you can go to Denny's. Uh, oh, I don't know. Or, yeah. But anyway, you got to get what you can. Of. Yeah, well, practice this stuff. It's a very good story. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> yeah, and the better you you will get, and also the more of these you do, the the better you get at spotting the patterns too. You know, the more you do, the more you are more easier it is. My grammar is really terrible right now. <laughs> the more you do, the easier it is to see the patterns among all the symbols. Yeah. Kind of like the those puzzles that had all these different lines and dots and colors and then in if you look closely there's a there's actually a picture inside all these dots remember you kind of spot the boy the cart and the donkey inside there but the better you get at spotting these patterns the better you are at doing the proofs isn't that true yep yeah so practice yeah so good luck with the proofs